Did you know? At this very moment, there is a skeleton inside you. Happy Spooky Month, everyone! Today, I'll be going over designing a creature based off of a typical Halloween monster trope: the reanimated skeleton. If you don't know, I'm trying to make my own creature collector based off of science topics. But before I show you my own design, as most people are familiar with Pokemon. I'll go over how they tackled making a design based on skeletons, but in order to do so, well, we first have to talk about Pokemon's most infamous mystery. In Pokemon Red and Blue, there is an old man in Viridian City. If you listen to what he has to say, make sure. You're not too quick in going away, for if you choose to go for a coastal swim, you might encounter them. Missing No was one of gaming's earliest mysteries—a garbled mess of pixels, as if they're taking a form no mere mortal could comprehend. But if your name had a specific letter at a specific slot, you might see it take form. As a ghost or one of two skeletons. The scariest part of the story is that this is no urban myth. This is all true. The less scary part is that even though this is all very unintentional, this glitch could be explained through code. When you talk to the old man, he gives you a tutorial on how to catch Pokemon. And replaces your name with old man, while your name is temporarily stored in another part of the game, which happens to be where wild Pokemon are determined. This shouldn't matter at all because everything reverts back when entering a new wild area. But if you fly to the coast of Cinnabar Island, this specific strip of tiles does not reset the code. So the wild Pokemon there are generated with the nonsensical values that is your name, pulling up a corrupted sprite, and having an impossible number of levels. I'll provide links to other videos that go deeper into this topic down in the description. The best part of missing no is how you can actually catch it and use it to multiply an item in your inventory, but is at the risk of corrupting the rest of your game. But why the ghost image and the skeletons? Well, there are sprites used in other parts of the game. The ghosts are special encounters in Lavender Town, and the skeletons are from the fossil exhibit of the Pewter City Museum. Speaking of fossils, while they're not exactly the reanimated skeleton monster, Pokemon began with three lines based off of prehistoric creatures achieved by resurrecting fossils. They would continue to use this trope in later games. I already talked about them in a past video. Go check it out if you're interested. However, our question remains: Has there ever been a Pokemon that represents a reanimated skeleton yet? Can you tell me? What's wrong with the following images? That's right, everything. But there's no denying that these Halloween decorations go pretty hard. The main issue of making a skeletal design is just how complex they could be. There are many gaps and holes that provide a complicated silhouette, which makes drawing such a character, especially animating one, a horrifying task. So, what is the easiest way to represent a skeleton? The skull, medically called the cranium, twenty-two uniquely shaped bones to protect the brain and to form a face. Cubone's line does exactly this, featuring an iconic skull. However, The fact that they are wearing their mother's skull instead of actually being the skull distances them from the reanimated skeleton trope. Thus, we'll move on to another mod. In Generation Three, the skull also features a skull 
and additional bone patterns on their back, having a more grim reaper look. Not a typical skeleton monster, but the closest one we have so far. However, the evolutions of Duskull do go into other inspirations, like mummies and the Japanese Chochin Obake, a paper lantern ghost. While drawing an animated skeleton would be hard, what if you had access to a 3D model? It is significantly easier to use a rig to animate a skeleton than to redraw them over and over, which is what we see in Sword and Shield's Eternatus, who resembles a draconic skeleton. Eternatus remains to be one of the most complex designs to this day, and such a design would have been much more painful to animate back when 2D animation was used. But they're an alien legendary, a being that's out of this world and also out of Pokemon's regular conventions. They should look weird. But we would actually get a resurrected skeleton Pokemon in the latest Pokemon Scarlet and Violet with Houndstone, a skeletal dog with a tombstone on their head. Most of their exposed skeleton is hidden beneath their fur, which is a very clever way to simplify the silhouette while still presenting as a skeleton due to their skull face and bony appendages. By the way, despite having sand rush and having stone in their name, Houndstone is only a ghost type. I really wonder why Pokemon is so averse to making a rock ghostmon. Makes me wonder what a ghost rockmon would eventually be. I honestly shouldn't complain because the one I am showing you today isn't exactly that type either. It was a late summer night. The neighborhood reported the sound of a young man calling for help. But when officials arrived at the scene, they were too late, and the suspect was long gone. However, investigators did manage to find a single piece of evidence, a clump of hair, and it wasn't the victim's. In forensics, DNA can be analyzed in four steps. Step one, extract the DNA. Step two, quantitation. Check how much DNA is extracted. Make sure the DNA isn't from some surrounding bacteria, and that the DNA is in good enough condition to go on. Step 3. Amplify the amount of DNA so you have enough to have a proper result. A process called polymerase chain reaction, also called PCR, does just this. DNA polymerase is used to make copies of segments of the original DNA. But not just copies, but copies of specific segments. Forensic databases use the same set of polymerases to copy DNA at many specific areas. If the DNA themselves are different, these copied sections would have different lengths, which leads us to our last step. Step 4. Separation. There are multiple ways to separate the DNA fragments by length, but the gist of it is like a sieve. Smaller segments have an easier time going through the holes, while longer ones are left behind. One such method is called gel electrophoresis, where phoresis means to be carried. DNA is negatively charged, which means you can run an electric current and they would follow it. So if you dye the DNA, put them in a gel, and run an electric current through them, over time, you can see the bands separate as the shorter segments grow through the gel more quickly than the longer ones do. This is where I finally get to show you my Stemamon, Jelter a slimy fish with gel all around them, with bands going across their back representing the separated bands of DNA. I call this a hydrophasma type, as I aim to make my own game with these creatures one day. And Jelter is actually based off of the hagfish, which secretes slime as part of their defenses. Now, I recognize Jelter doesn't really look like a hagfish, as they also resemble the filter-feeding whale shark. The investigators found a match, and a hunt was on. What is a gel, but a miserable pile of liquid suspensed in a solid matrix? Now say you want to remove that liquid, to leave the solid behind. It's much easier said than done, as drying the liquid out pulls on the solid, making it collapse. So how would you actually leave the solid behind? We've gone over phase changes before, 
And if you see the phase diagram, there is a certain temperature and pressure where liquids and gases are nearly indistinguishable. The critical point. Hey, what's up everybody? The critical point can be used to carefully transition the liquid into gel into gas and delicately replace it with air, basically just leaving the solid matrix behind. And what you have left is called an aerogel, the skeleton of a gel. They are fantastic thermal insulators due to all the air inside of them. So, Jelter evolves into Gelero, the aerophasma type. I personally wanted an encompassing insulator ability that blocks both electro and pyro moves, but an aerogel could be made up of various materials, including graphene, which would make it electrically conductive. So the ability here is specifically a thermal insulator. Today, we went through a lot more than I expected for this spooky scary skeleton special. From solving one of gaming's greatest mysteries, to solving a murder. I, I think that's what happened. I got more things planned for spooky month, and I hope I get to share them all with you. I have a whole playlist where I go over my stem-based creature collector, where I shared over 75 designs so far. So if that interests you, go ahead and subscribe. I also want to thank my Patreon members for their support, but if you like this video, you can always like and share it for free. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and good morning.